follow along, but you don't have to because I have it up here. All right, so let's talk about polytheism. Why did we start with this? Well, there is probably not, not an, uh, you know, a topic that is more relevant to the church than this topic. You're probably, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, I've never heard of it before. Ah, but you have because whenever anybody serves multiple gods, gods of anything, we're dealing with people in the New Testament, we're dealing with people in the Old Testament, during the intertestamental period, the time between 450 and the time of Jesus, and we're also dealing with the early church. Again, when I teach, I like to teach all of that information because we're Christians. From the time of Abraham all the way till today is one unit of history. It's all about God. And what we read, what we study, what we understand is all about him. Whether we're talking about the New Testament, the Old Testament, the Inner Testament, or even the early church, it's all about him. And that's the awesome thing about this. And so we are actually going to be going through all of those periods today to understand this. Well, why do we need to do that? Well, because wherever you go in the Bible, or even learning about the early church, we find that that is a problem they had. One of the things about the Old Testament we, we learn is that when you read the prophets, you seem like God is very, very angry. Well, there's a reason why. And this is it. Why do the prophets, are, is the prophets things are so hardcore in here? It's all because of this. They didn't serve him. They served everybody but him. And we'll also talk about religious sinnerism that they served him and other people. And God wants us only to serve him. But does that mean that we're, well, that's only a, that's a couple thousand years ago. That doesn't do anything for us. We don't need this. Well, we do. Because when we have a sports figures, those are gods. Why? We wear their shirts. I, I mean, I don't like, I don't, but I mean, wear their shirts, wear their shoes, they wear their clothes, they have these names on our backs, they have our car, stickers on our cars. Everything we do is revolved around them. Not us, but I mean, people do that. Movie stars, same thing. So wherever we go, we're still dealing with this issue everywhere we go. So that's why we're going to go through this. And I'm when I, I went through, and I think there was not a subject that I spent more time studying and getting ready for than this. It's probably eight months I've been working on this particular, this particular week's subject because it's so much information. We're not going to go over God after God after God because there's thousands of them. But what we're going to do is give you guys understanding and ideas. We're going to talk about many different ideas you're going to find that when you read this information, it will help you to understand about the problems. For instance, the issues with the sexuality, the, is the issues with trying to please them, the issues of many different things. So let's get going. So people throughout the ages attempted to explain how things work. How do things work? For instance, what's the sun? Why is it when it's warm, it's up? When it's not, it gets colder. What is lightning? What causes drought? Man, my, I has a rain, haven't rained for three years. What's up with that? Why do, we, why do we not float into space? Why do we get sick? Why does it get darker during the wintertime? And then light comes back again. See, we all know about that information. We've been trained. We go to, we go to grade, even in grade school. Have you ever seen the smarter a fifth grader thing? Let me tell you, they give you a lot of information. These people had no clue, and so what they would do is they would set apart gods and say a god had to have done this, a god had to have done this. What is a definition? Well, in Christianity, it's basically a ruler, a supreme being of moral authority. In other situations, superhuman being or spirit worshiped to have power. Polytheism, the belief in multiple gods, now, I, I was reading a few months back a guy saying, well, back in the early times, there were a lot of what we call monotheists, which is belief in one God. But the difference is, they may just believe in their God there, but they know that their neighbor's gods are alive also. And they know that their other neighbor's gods and their other neighbor's gods. So there were belief in multiple gods. But the thing is also a big problem is the religious synchronism. Religious synchronism means the combining of two religious practices. We have that today. It's called chrislam. 
Christianity and Islam. Okay? It's very big in America. I went, I was, and when I was living in Denver, I went to a school and, for, and I was going, walking up the stairs and I see, you know, Bibles and everything else. I thought it was a Christian school until I went, until I went into this area where they talked to all like these big posters about Muhammad and everything else. It's very big in America. So religious synchronism. One of the things we're going to find though, and this is all through the Kings and Chronicles that would be important for you to understand, is that in those books, when they talk about that the king did good, but he did not tear down the high places. That's religious synchronism. They were serving God and somebody else, whoever else that may be. So all the way through the Old Testament, this happened. And it even started into the New Testament, and we're even going to talk about it attempting to start in the early church and how the early church handled it. Gods can be almost anything. They're usually created in our image. Have you ever noticed that if you ever watch a movie, all the aliens all are standing upright? They may have different faces, different heads. If you ever notice all the, all the Marvel and Avengers and all the comic book, those, those guys are all these gods that look a lot like humans. But so did the Egyptians and everybody else. They just put different heads on them. This is Anubis, Horus, and, and Bastet. Egyptian gods. Notice they all look human, but they just have animal heads on them. Very normal. Very normal in polytheism. Gods were often impersonal, and that's a big issue. Most of the time, they didn't, you know, there was no love between them and the gods. And I'll tell you, Rome had a big problem with this. What, this there was many reasons why they persecuted the Christians and the Jews. This was one of them. They could not understand why a god would want to come down to earth. And why would the god die? I mean, duh, gods don't die. Why would, god, why would the god want to leave home and come down to earth and die? But ours did. One of the thing, reasons Romans really were afraid of Christians, didn't like Christians, because they thought gods were way up here, and they had to be, not to be worshipped, but really to be adored, make them happy. They were also warriors and win battles. That was a big, that's a big issue, like we see in Marduk here. Babylonian god. I'm sorry, it cut off part of, my, uh, part of the bottom of my um, PowerPoint, but the Babylonian god. Many of these gods were mighty warriors. Because one of the things that they did without, throughout history is they put backstories. They came up with these elaborate stories about the gods. The gods did this. I mean, if you ever read Homer's The Odyssey, it's all about these stories about the gods and everything. And people loved that stuff. Gods were fickle. They needed to be coerced into helping people. Hey, you know what? Let's get the gods to do this for us. Let's make them happy. Let's, do, let's have them do this. That's Zeus. And Kurt said that regarding Homer and the Odyssey, and if you don't know Homer and the Odyssey, Homer and the Odyssey was the famous, famous book. You know, have you ever heard like the things with the Cyclops? That's the guy with the Cyclops and stuff in it. Anyway, he went out on this, on this you know, trip, and he met the gods, and the gods, him and the gods interacted all these different ways. But I like what Kurt said. He said, no matter what Homer said or does, sometimes they listen, the gods. Other times they don't. Trying to figure out what went wrong was totally a waste of time. And that kind of, that's kind of the idea. I, I love this statement from this gentleman named Kurtz, because he's right. That's the way it was. Their gods, there was no relationship with the god. There was no this having love between you and the god. It's kind of a love-hate relationship. I'll make you happy. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Just, you know, just make sure my crops grow. Make sure I get rain. Make sure my enemies die in battle. That's the idea. What can I do to get from the gods? Doesn't that sound, it sound familiar, though? What can we do to get from God? All right, so let's talk about Romans. Let me read a verse to you guys. And I think this epitomizes, this epitomizes the way God sees this and the, historically what happened. So I'm going to read, actually, I'm going to start with verse 21, Romans 1, 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. 
but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, like we just saw, made to look like mortal man, being and birds, animals, and reptiles. We'll talk about reptiles later. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires, their hearts to sexual impurity, degrading of their bodies with one another. Guys, let me tell you something. It's very, very normal for most of these religions back in the day to have homosexuality and all kinds of sexual escapades. Because when you can create a God in your image, when you can create a God to do whatever, hey, let's make the God want sex, you know, or have us have, have, us have sex. Having temple prostitutes. That was happening, and that happened in Jerusalem. There were times that they had male prostitutes. And interesting thing about male prostitutes are females couldn't go to the temple. Guess what they were there for? You can figure that one out. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped the created things rather than the creator, who is forever praised. Okay? The thing is, these guys, when they were serving these gods, they made gods in whatever image they thought they should to do whatever they wanted them to do. And in the process, we see in almost all societies, they had degradation, sexual degradation all the time. What in, and I'll tell you, when we go through the law in a few weeks, we're going to see the, how God sees that issue. Because when he's in the law, God deals with that through multiple verses on that. God deals with the sexual issues, wanting us to be pure, wanting us to have a wife, wanting us to be faithful to one another because of this fact. Sexual and the gods often went together. They were very much true. And by the way, um, I tried to, I, I created uh, pictures for every one of these guys. Uh, let me just tell you, Aphrodite, it's kind of hard to find a dressed Aphrodite online. Uh, and so I didn't want to go rated R with this, so we decided to go rated PG on this. So that's why she looks like some girl from, you know, the 50s or something. Who knows? So, all right, so let's talk about how the early church deals with this. The early church. Now, in 150, now it says circa. If you ever see the word circa, that means circa means about around 150 AD. This was written. Now, actually, this came from the early apostles. They, believe, they call it the Apostle Creed because the beginning and creation of this particular thing come from the apostles during the time, you know, of James, John, Peter, those guys. And the thing is, it's a creed, and some of you guys have been, you know, it, a lot of, some Protestant churches are like, oh my gosh, creeds are bad. Well, there's a reason why they did this back then. First and foremost, people couldn't read. 90% of the people could not read. So what they did is they, put, they had them do statements of faith so they can repeat, so they can remember it. Very nice. They also wanted to make sure that people understood and it went against whatever problem. There was one of the biggest problems with Gnosticism, you probably have heard that, and also Martianism, a guy named Martian, he was not from Mars, he was Mar and he wasn't Marvin either, not Marvin the Martian. What they did is they basically denied the virgin birth. One of the reasons why they put born under Pontius Pilate was to date it, to tell everybody throughout history that this happened on this date, and we know for a fact it was here. It's kind of like why when um, Eisenhower went into the Holocaust, he made them videotape everything. No different. It's what they're trying to do. So the apostles wrote this for the people. Now, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. So about 150. He wanted to make sure that people understood that. Well, one of the problems happened that in 325, the time of Constantine, Constantine and everybody come together and said, look, we got we to do something. Because what was happening is many people in the church, there were a lot of heretics and a lot of bad things happening, trying to say that Jesus was another god. Ooh, wait a minute, that sounds like polytheism. That the Holy Spirit was another god. So they changed it because of that fact. So I want, the reason why I'm going over this to help you understand, and even in the early church they had this problem. 
they came to Nice, which is in Turkey. Now, by the way, just so you know, Rome was not in ascendancy here. Rome was not the leader here. It has nothing to do with Rome. Actually, that's why everything was done in Constantinople around Nice, because that was the real major power him. And also a guy named Alexa um, Athanasius of Alexandria was here, one of my favorite uh, church fathers. He was uh, actually a very interesting guy. He, so he was the leader. Rome was not the leader. Wasn't even, they weren't even powerful at this time. But Al Athanasius was. Now, I like Athanasius because he is named the Black Dwarf. He was a short, short little black guy from Alexandria, Egypt. And during this time, we've got to understand, before the Muslims came in and, and wiped out and took over all of North Africa, Africa and Europe got along. People, people of different colors and races, everything mixed all the time, just like we see this. So Athanasius was in charge of this huge thing under the leadership of Con Constantine. This is what they changed it to because they wanted to make sure it didn't turn polytheistic. I believe in one God, one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, meaning Jesus is God, light from light, sounds like, sounds like the book of John, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, meaning that equal with God. Basically, do you read what they're saying here? This is awesome. They're saying Jesus is God. The reason why they're doing that, because remember, Rome was polytheistic. Everybody around him were polytheistic. They wanted to make sure that when people stated who Jesus was, they knew who Jesus was. They will go on to learn for the Holy Spirit, the same thing. Within 100 years, they're going to deal with the Holy Spirit and the same exact issue. And so this is why that was written. I always thought this was fascinating. This guy is the guy that the problem was, Athen, um, Arius. Uh, he was actually considered a heretic. And actually, if you see pictures of him, you'll see heretic underneath there. Yeah, they, they didn't like him too much. The reason is what he did is said, Jesus is not up here. Jesus is somewhere down here. Arianism almost destroyed the church. The idea that Jesus is someone down here. That is just like Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses. They're Arian religions. Jesus is not God. Jesus is created somewhere down here. God's up here, Jesus is down here. And so this guy, Arianism almost destroyed the church. They actually, Arianism actually took over for a while as, as predominant. That's how, that's how much of a problem this was, and that's why they had to go to this, because Arianism came in for about 300 years. But ultimately, the church wanted to make sure Christianity did not become another polytheistic religion. That where Jesus and the Holy Spirit were not one of three gods. Very important. All right, let's explore how th that affected people throughout the ages. Now, in Rome in 44 BC, Julius Caesar was assassinated by the Roman Senate. You're saying to yourself, what the heck does this have to do with anything to do with the Bible? This has everything to do with the Bible. Okay. The reason why this happened was that he portrayed himself as a kind of a deity or a god above everybody else. The Roman Senate didn't like that. Rome was a republic. And if you don't know what a republic is, America is a republic. No king. Rome didn't have a king or a Caesar during this time, per se. No Caesar. He's Caesar, but he's the first guy. Rome republic wanted to, they weren't happy about him becoming so great, but if they got their way, history would have changed completely. But he, they didn't get their way because something else happened. After the assassination, a comet was seen in Rome, which is now called Caesar's Comet. Stayed in the sky for eight days. Now, you've got to understand, we know what comets are. They didn't. To us, we would have pointed at this guy and say, oh, dude, cool. Comet, oh my god, that's awesome, like, yo, comet there, dude. We're like, hey, that's great, but to Rome, this was a sign from the gods 
that Caesar was brought to heaven by the gods. And because of that, for the next 450 years, dire things would happen. The sinners wanted to get rid of this king figure, continue with the Republic, but that's not what happened. Caesar Augustus would end up reigning in his father's steps. And the adoration of the emperor began. Now, if anybody knows any about their Christian history, what did Rome do to the Christians? Persecuted them. Why did they persecute them specifically? Why did they persecute them? Anybody know why they persecuted them specifically? Pardon me? Um, no. Not, not quite. In the beginning, that was, that was yes, sir. They would not recognize. What did they, did anybody know what they did not do specifically to Caesar? Bow, Bow but more than, more than that, burn incense to him. It was all about incense. They didn't burn incense to Caesar, like this guy's doing. And what that meant was, Caesar wasn't God. But because they, the people truly believed that he was from God, if the, because the Christians didn't bow down to him, the Christians didn't burn incense to him, then the Christians were actually hurting the country. They wanted to make the gods happy. So all you're asking, and this is what they did. They said, well, all we're asking you to do, Christian, is, is burn incense to the emperor. And the Christians said, no, I don't burn incense to anybody. I bow down to God alone. And that's why they were persecuted. Okay? Was that's the reason why, because of this fact. Now do you see why this is so important? Because this affected the Christians. The Jews did the same thing. The Jews refused to do that. They gave in to the Jews for a while. In 70 AD, they then finally had enough of the Jews and they destroyed the temple. Remember Jesus said the temple's gonna be destroyed? It was destroyed because of this issue, because of that. Because polytheism, they believe that God's blessed Caesar. This, would this went back for a thousand years, but also would come. Okay, sorry. So what happened was, the whole thing was, is they wanted to make sure that the countries, they believe that the country's lifeline is based on the gods. If you're not blessing Caesar, you're not, help, you're not making the gods happy, the gods are going to be mad at us, and we're no longer going to win battles. Rome was very big on this, because guess what Rome won a lot of? Battles. So to them, you don't burn to Caesar, we don't win battles, the gods are mad at us, we're out of here. Not a lot of fun. So this continued on for a very long time. So now we just saw, we saw the early church that had a problem. We saw in Jesus' time, in the Jews, they had problems with this. So let's talk about what happened to make, about the de desire and belief about making God happy. Let's talk about that because we want to make sure, we want to kind of get into that. In 1346, an unseen enemy came, into the, come, came in and he challenged even the most robust believer. These were Christians during this time. The Black Death came in. Okay, we remember it wiped out a quarter of Europe. People were really freaked out because they didn't know what caused it. Sadly, what happened was the, the Although it's condemned, the church condemned it, the thing is, people would go, and these, these guys are called flagellants. What people would do is say, let's make God happy. Let's beat ourselves. They would go down, they would walk down miles and take these things and beat themselves, thinking that's going to make God happy. They would hurt themselves. They would, they would bruise themselves. These guys would die. And a lot of these guys got sick and died anyway because of the, the plague. But they thought that making God happy was everything. Now, these were Christians, but the idea is they did not understand God. They did not understand God. They didn't understand that a microscopic organism called Yersinia pestis did this. And because they didn't understand that, and they didn't understand God, 
Because you've got to understand, the church kind of really, during this time, this is kind of a very bad time during the church anyway. So people were really not really doing well anyway. So they didn't realize that. Also, do you notice that uh, it says uh, they also killed the cats? They thought cats were evil? Well, that's not a good idea because uh, cats killed the rats. That would have helped them. Pleasing the gods was often paramount for survival. Making God happy. They really thought that making God happy. And unfortunately, these were Christians, but they still did not understand what was going on. So let's look at, let's look at a biblical event real quick about that. Let's see. Right here, and we just go to here. And, and we're going to go, we're going to, go to uh, 1 Kings 18.25. And this is basically about Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Okay? Baal was, uh, we're going to go into him later, but Baal was a god that they were, that worshipped and, may, and very big in, in northern kingdom in Israel during this time. What was happening is the prophets were pretty much basically saying God is not there. It's only we're going to worship Baal, that we're going to look to him. So Eliza said to the prophets, said, choose one of your bulls and prepare it since there are many of you. There are about 100, they said. Call on the name of your God, but don't light the fire. So they took the bull and they prepared it. So basically, like, this, like you see this thing, and I don't think it would look like that. It was cinder blocks. But the thing is, they, put, they, they built an altar, they put the bull, and the idea was they were going to have God, their God was going to light fire, come down from heaven, and burn up the, the offering. That's what Elijah was telling him to do. Go ahead and do it. Call on God. If, if, and the idea is, if he's real, then just let him do it. They called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. Well, I wonder why. He's not there. And they danced around the altar they made. Soon Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's in deep thought or busy traveling. Now, here's interesting. You may look, you look at that and you're laughing, but you know what? Elijah wasn't kidding. They thought that. The gods are fickle. The gods are like us. They, they sleep. To, to the people, the gods sleep. The gods are alive, you know, awake. The gods eat. The gods are happy. The gods are sad. The gods, gods have emotions. Gods have this. They thought that. And Elijah was telling them something. He was mocking them, but the reality was they actually believed this stuff. They believed that maybe he was just asleep. We'll just wake him up. So this is what they did. And notice what they did because of this to wake their gods up. Okay? So they shouted louder and they slashed themselves with swords and spears until their blood flowed. Didn't we just see that a problem with Christians doing that? Let's get God to like us. Again, there is no personal God here with these, peop with these people. There was no personal loving God that he wants you to be kind and, and, and generous, and God, God wants to give to you. And what is God, God says in Psalm 103, he heals your diseases and cures your sicknesses and gives you, and gives you hope and gives all this stuff. There was not that stuff going on. Okay? There was not, not with this. Midday they passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time passed for evening sacrifice. But there was no response. So anyway, so what ended up happening is we, we know that Elijah said, well, come here. And finally, Elijah called on the name of God. And what did God do? Fire came down. Bam. Because God is real. And the interesting thing is we're going to see when you go through the Old Testament over and over again, you're going to see this kind of thing happen all the time. And, and God saying to them, when we go through the law, we're going to be talking about this in a few weeks, that God said to them, all these idols of wood, stone mean nothing. They're not alive. These people trusted in their God for all this different stuff. But their God didn't answer because he wasn't there.
Let's look at a few extreme ways of worship. <coughs> sorry, sorry. In three, now, this is during the intertestamental period. In approximately 330 BC, the wife of Philip II, who was basically, this was, this was, Philip II was the father of Alexander the Great, by the way. She was accused of impropriety. She had, the, the, the cult was, she was um, looking at the cult of Dionysus. What she would do is she would bring snakes into there and let snakes run around because the cult of Dionysus had much to do with snakes snake worship and if you ever see like certain a lot of times with a lot of these images you'll see these these graven images they have snakes around them snakes were thought of as good but in the bible snakes are not thought of as good okay snakes are always bad so what she did is they actually think that she's trying to have sexual relations with the snake how would you like and okay so think of this as so my you know you have your wife is like, your wife loves snakes. And she's like, you know, we really like snakes, dear. I just let six more in there. Just watch out. Let's just step real close because, you know, they might bite at your ankles. That'd be like, it's like, well, honey, let's time to get rid of the snakes. It's not a good thing here. It's the snakes are not good. Yeah, I can, I can imagine finally, just finally building up rafters to keep yourself away from the snakes that biting at your ankles. I mean, I can't imagine. Anyway, but... That was a big problem because these guys believe snakes were a very big part of this. And you'll see this in polytheism. Here's the god Moloch from Ammon. Ammon is a neighbor of Israel. We'll talk about these guys next week. Ammon. Because Ammon was actually one, one of Lot's sons. That one of the things that, that Moloch did is they wanted child sacrifice. Now remember... Did Moloch tell them this, or did they come up with it themselves? They come up with it themselves. Now, these are pretty, friend, this is, you're getting pretty desperate when you're thinking, what do I have to do to make the gods happy? Well, I think I'm just going to sacrifice my child to them. Do you think God was very happy about this? No, because you know what? God said, eh, eh, ain't happening. He specifically forbade the worship of Moloch, and he also forbade child sacrifices in the Old Testament. This is a big issue. They did this. Whenever you see the word Moloch in the Old Testament, that's a bad thing. Solomon actually sacrificed to this guy. That's how bad Solomon got. It was terrible. Often gods were served food and entertainment to keep them happy. Yes, it's true. Babylon on a daily basis had singers, songwriters, musicians, food servers to serve the gods daily. Because, hey, gods want entertainment too, don't they? Hey, let's keep them happy. The idea is we'll keep the gods happy. You serve them food, we give them all this wonderful stuff, and guess what? They'll bless us. That's the idea. So the thing is, they serve God's food all the time. But sacrifices and offerings of food were not just a traditional of just Jewish. Now, we know in the Bible they sacrifice bulls. They, sacri they have grain sacrifices, right? Well, the thing is, is that was actually done everywhere. It was a very normal practice. However, when we get into the law in a couple weeks, we're going to talk about this issue of why God wanted you to do it. And not only why he wanted you, but why he wanted it to be perfect and it needed to have one component. What component was that? What is the one component God wanted to deal with? What? Blood. blood. Yes, blood. Because blood is cleansing. And blood is important because it is the blood of who that saves us? Blood of Christ that saves us. God with foreshadowing of Christ to come because blood. You make sure you always in the sacrifices, God always said, make sure there is no blood in this anymore. They wanted to make sure you wash out the insides, everything else to make sure the blood, because the blood would go on the altar, but they do not eat with the blood in it. Not a good thing because God, because blood is life. The high places. The high places are basically something we find constantly in the Old Testament. High places were, 
Because the idea of high places is that they wanted to get closer to God. Again, they think that being higher up in the air is going to make the gods like them more. So they would go to the highest points and they would build an altar like this guy. And I guarantee that is some, someone built that. That didn't just happen on its own. That is, a, that is an altar. They actually found a lot of altars in the higher places around Jerusalem and those areas because this was a big problem. And, and God always said, don't do this. You don't need to go higher. Does anybody have anybody, anybody remember a story in the Bible that dealt with something that's very high? Tower of Babel, that's right. Tower of Babel. They thought that we can do it. I will build it. I will do it. I will make it. I will be like God. And it sounds like today, what we can do today. So the other thing is moving dirt. Moving dirt was important. A lot of times they'll find, you'll hear that they're, they're packed up dirt and put it on their camels and they moved it in the Old Testament. Moving dirt was important because they thought that, that the God of that land would go with them if they moved the dirt. So what they would do is they would pack up dirt, they would move it, pour it out, built an altar, and now they can worship the God and get blessings from that God. Notice the idea behind all of this, to gain something we want to get what we can get from God. Get blessings. Get this. Get that. So I'm going to move dirt to move over here so I can get blessings. I'll tell you, one of the, the, the guys that did this the most, and we will, we're almost, we're almost done here, but we will talk about him, is going, is going to be Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great. We'll get into him later on. He actually wasn't a bad guy. He actually allowed Israel to return after the Babylonian captivity. But the thing is, Cyrus, the, one of the things Cyrus the Great did is he wanted to make sure that the gods, all the gods were happy. So he let all these people return, gave them money, do all this stuff, just so the gods would bless him. And guess, ultimately what he wanted was God to bless him in battle. It was very, it was very, it was very selfish in a way, but it was a blessing for the Jews. All right. So what, let's go one more, one more slide, then we'll finish the rest up next week. Is this interesting to everybody? Is there guys, you guys like this? Okay, good. So we'll get more next week. We're going to get some more next week. Sorry, we're going to go long. So one more thing. So stone idols. Stone idols are also a big thing because they would worship. Now, it's interesting. You know, if you ever think, it's actually kind of sad because if you ever saw that what these idols look like, look at this guy. I mean, does that look like a happy individual? Now, I will say what's interesting. Now, and I know the church did this for a while pro prior to the Protestant Reformation, and still today some, some, some churches do this. You always see Christ as being very sad, right? But you know what's interesting is, if you, they is um, I was watching a show one time, and this guy was talking, it was fascinating. He said that in the early, he showed the earliest Christian paintings of the third century and second century, in all of those paintings down in the, and they were, these are the paintings in the catacombs because Christians had to, had to hide in the catacombs from persecution. But in all those Christian paintings, would you believe Jesus was smiling? All of them. He was always smiling. The earliest Christian paintings. That's one of the reasons why I like to teach the early church because people don't realize that in the early church, it was, they enjoyed it. They had fun. They had, Christ was happy. Christ was, it's really sad that as time went on, these, everybody, he always looked sad. But he was actually happy and smiling in all these early Christian paintings. But the reality is, is most people, when they fashion idols, they're not very happy. So, all right, is there any questions before we end up? Wonderful. So, please, all I'm going to ask you guys to do is please go through, and I really recommend going through in the, um, the PowerPoint again. You have access to it. Please go through it again. Read through it. I think you're going to gain a lot. I know I didn't put a lot of Bible verses here because I didn't want to overwhelm you with tons and tons of, of the Bible, but just realize that all of this stuff you're going to see in there. So, Thank you guys so much. I look forward to next week, and we'll finish this next week, and then after that, we're going to go through lands of the Bible. All right, guys, have a good night.